Economics and Politics in the Era of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat by Vladimir Lenin I had intended to write a short pamphlet on the subject indicated in the title on the occasion of the second anniversary of Soviet power, but owing to the rush of everyday work I have so far been unable to get beyond preliminary preparations for some of the sections. I have, therefore, decided to essay a brief, summarized exposition of what, in my opinion, are the most essential ideas on the subject. A summarized exposition, of course, possesses many disadvantages and shortcomings. Nevertheless, a short magazine article may perhaps achieve the modest aim in view, which is to present the problem and the groundwork for its discussion by the communists of various nations. 1. Theoretically, there can be no doubt that between capitalism and communism, there lies a definite transition period which must combine the features and properties of both these forms of social economy. This transition period has to be a period of struggle between dying capitalism and nascent communism, or, in other words, between capitalism, which has been defeated but not destroyed, and communism, which has been born but is still very feeble. The necessity for a whole historical era distinguished by these transitional features should be obvious not only to Marxists, but to any educated person who is in any degree acquainted with the theory of development. Yet, all the talk on the subject of the transition to socialism, which we hear from present-day petty bourgeois democrats and such in spite of their spurious socialist label, are all the leaders of the Second International, including some individuals as MacDonald, Jin Longue, Kautsky, and Freitag Adler is marked by complete disregard of this obvious truth. Petty bourgeois democrats are distinguished by an aversion to class struggle, by their dreams of avoiding it, by their efforts to smooth over, to reconcile, to remove sharp corners. Such democrats, therefore, either avoid recognizing any necessity for a whole historical period of transition from capitalism to communism, or regard it as their duty to concoct schemes for reconciling the two contending forces instead of leading the struggle of one of those forces. 2. In Russia, the dictatorship of the proletariat must inevitably differ in certain particulars from what it would be in the advanced countries, owing to the very great backwardness and petty bourgeois character of our country. But the basic forces and the basic forms of social economy are the same in Russia as in any capitalist country, so that the peculiarities can apply only to what is of lesser importance. The basic forms of social economy are capitalism, petty commodity production, and communism. The basic forces are the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, the peasantry in particular, and the proletariat. The economic system in Russia in the era of the dictatorship of the proletariat represents the struggle of labor, united on communist principles on the scale of a vast state and making its first steps. The struggle against petty commodity production and against the capitalism which still persists and against that which is newly arising on the basis of petty commodity production. In Russia, labor is united communistically insofar as First, private ownership of the means of production has been abolished. And secondly, the proletarian state power is organizing large-scale production on state-owned land and in state-owned enterprises on a national scale, is distributing labor power among the various branches of production and the various enterprises, and is distributing among the working people large quantities of articles of consumption belonging to the state. We speak of the first steps of communism in Russia. It is also put that way in our party program adopted in March 1919. Because all these things have been only partially affected in our country, or to put it differently, their achievement is only in its first stages. We accomplished 
instantly, at one revolutionary blow, all that can, in general, be accomplished instantly. On the first day of the dictatorship of the proletariat, for instance, on October 26th, November 8th, 1917, the private ownership of land was abolished without compensation for the big landowners. The big landowners were expropriated. Within the space of a few months, practically all the big capitalists, owners of factories, joint stock companies, banks, railways, and so forth, were also expropriated without compensation. The state organization of large-scale production in industry and the transition from workers' control to workers' management of factories and railways. This has, by and large, already been accomplished. But in relation to agriculture, it has only just begun. State farms, i.e. large farms organized by the worker state on state-owned land. Similarly, we have only just begun the organization of various forms of cooperative societies of small farmers as a transition from co petty commodity agriculture to communist agriculture. The same must be said of the state-organized distribution of products in place of private trade, i.e. the state procurement and delivery of grain to the cities and of industrial products to the countrysides. Available statistical data on this subject will be given below. Peasant farming continues to be petty commodity production. Here we have an extremely broad and very sound, deep-rooted basis for capitalism, a basis on which capitalism persists or arises anew in a bitter struggle against communism. The forms of this struggle are private speculation and profiteering, versus state procurement of grain and other products, and state distribution of products in general. 3. To illustrate these abstract theoretical propositions, let us quote actual figures. According to the figures of the People's Commissariat of Food, state procurement of grain in Russia between August 1, 1917 and August 1, 1918 amounted to about 30 million poods, and in the following year to about 111 million poods. During the first three months of the next campaign, 1919 to 1920, procurements will presumably total about 45 million poods as against 37 million poods for the same period, August to October in 1918. Side note, one pood is equal to about 16 kilograms or 36 pounds. These figures speak clearly of a slow but steady improvement in the state of affairs from the point of view of the victory of communism over capitalism. This improvement is being achieved in spite of difficulties without world parallel. Difficulties due to the civil war, organized by Russian and foreign capitalists who are harnessing all the forces of the world's strongest powers. Therefore, in spite of the lies and slanders of the bourgeoisie of all countries, and of their open or masked henchmen, the socialists of the Second International, one thing remains beyond dispute. As far as the basic economic problem of the dictatorship of the proletariat is concerned, the victory of communism over capitalism in our country is assured. Throughout the world, the bourgeoisie is raging and fuming against Bolshevism and is organizing military expeditions, plots, etc. against the Bolsheviks. Because it realizes full well that our success in reconstructing the social economy is inevitable, provided we are not crushed by military force and its attempts to crush us in this way are not succeeding. The extent to which we have already vanquished capitalism in the short time we have had at our disposal, and despite the incredible difficulties under which we have had to work, will be seen from the following summarized figures. The Central Statistical Board has just prepared for the press data 
on the production and the consumption of grain, not for the whole Soviet Union, but only for 26 gubernias. The producing gubernias account for a urban population of 4.4 million and a rural population of 28.6 million. They produced, excluding seed and fodder, 625.4 million poods of grain. The Commissariat of Food delivered 20.9 million poods of grain. And there were 20.6 million profiteers. The total amount of grain at disposal of population in millions of poods was, for the urban, 41.5, and for the rural, 481.8. Their consumption per capita in poods per capita was 9.5 for the urban and 16.9 for the rural. Of consuming gubernias, there were 5.9 urban and 13.8 rural. They produced 114 million poods of grain, in which they delivered 20 million poods of grain, and there were 20 million profiteers. The urban region had 40 million poods of grain at disposal, and poods per capita in consumption was 6.8. The rural had 151.4 million poods of grain at disposal, and a grain consumption of 11 poods per capita. This means that of the total 26 gubernias, the population in millions was 52.7, they produced 739.4 poods of grain in millions. They delivered, by the commissary to food, 53 million poods and profited by 68.4. The total amount of grain at disposal of the population in millions was 714.7 and the average grain consumption by poods per capita was 13.6. Thus, approximately half the amount of grain supplied to the cities is provided by the commissariat of food, and the other half by profiteers. This same proportion is revealed by a careful survey made in 1918 of the food consumed by city workers. It should be borne in mind that for bread supplied by the state, the worker pays one-ninth of what he pays the profiteer. The profiteering price for bread is ten times greater than that of the state price. This is revealed by a detailed study of the workers' budgets. 4. A careful study of the figures quoted shows that they present an exact picture of the fundamental features of Russia's present-day economy. The working people have been emancipated from their age-old oppressors and exploiters, the landlords and capitalists. This step in the direction of real freedom and real equality is a step which, for its extent, dimensions and rapidity is without parallel in the world is ignored by the supporters of the bourgeoisie, including the petty bourgeois democrats, who, when they talk of freedom and equality, mean parliamentary bourgeois democracy, which they falsely declare to be democracy in general, or pure democracy, as Kautsky puts it. But the working people are concerned only with the real equality and real freedom, freedom from the landowners and capitalists, and that is why they give the Soviet government such solid support. In this peasant country, it was the peasantry as a whole who were the first to gain, who gained most, and gained immediately from the dictatorship of the proletariat. The peasant in Russia starved under the landowners and capitalists. 
Throughout the long centuries of our history, the peasant never had an opportunity to work for himself. He starved while handing out hundreds of millions of poods of grain to the capitalists for the cities and for export. Under the dictatorship of the proletariat, the peasant for the first time has been working for himself and feeding better than the city dweller. For the first time, the peasant has seen real freedom, freedom to eat his bread, freedom from starvation. In the distribution of land, as we know, the maximum equality has been established. In the vast majority of cases, the peasants are dividing the land according to the number of mouths to feed. Socialism means the abolition of class. In order to abolish classes, it is necessary first to overthrow the landowners and capitalists. This part of our task has been accomplished, but it is only a part, and moreover, not the most difficult part. In order to abolish classes, it is necessary, secondly, to abolish the difference between factory worker and peasant, to make workers of them all, and this cannot be done all at once. This task is incomparably more difficult and will of necessity take a long time. It is not a problem that can be solved by overthrowing a class. It can be solved only by the organizational reconstruction of the whole social economy, by a transition from individual, disunited, petty commodity production to large-scale social production. This transition must of necessity be extremely protracted, it may only be delayed and complicated by hasty and incautious administrative and legislative measures. It can be accelerated only by affording such assistance to the peasant as will enable him to effect an immense improvement in his whole farming technique to reform it radically. In order to solve the second and most difficult of the problem, the proletariat after having defeated the bourgeoisie, must unswervingly conduct its policy towards the peasantry along the following fundamental lines. The proletariat must separate, demarcate the working peasant from the peasant owner, the peasant worker from the peasant huckster, the peasant who labors from the peasant who profiteers, and in this demarcation lies the whole essence of socialism. And it is not surprising that the socialists who are socialists in word, but petty bourgeois democrats in deeds, the Martovs, the Chernovs, the Kautskys, and others, do not understand this essence of socialism. The demarcation we here refer to is an extremely difficult one, because in real life all the features of the peasant, however diverse they may be, however contradictory they may be, are fused into one whole. Nevertheless, demarcation is possible, and not only is it possible, it inevitably follows from the conditions of peasant farming and peasant life. The working peasant has for ages been oppressed by the landowners, the capitalists, the hucksters and profiteers, and by their state, including even the most democratic bourgeois republics. Throughout the ages, the working peasant has trained himself to hate and loathe these oppressors and exploiters, and this training, engendered by the conditions of life, compels the peasant to seek an alliance with the worker against the capitalist and against the profiteer and huckster. Yet at the same time, economic conditions, the conditions of commodity production, inevitably turn the peasant, not always, but in the vast majority of cases, into a huckster and profiteer. The statistics quoted above reveal a striking difference between the working peasant and the peasant profiteer. The peasant who, during 1918 and 1919, delivered to the hungry workers of the cities 40 million poods of grain at fixed state prices, who delivered this grain to the state agencies despite all the shortcomings of the latter, shortcomings fully realized by the workers' government, but which were unavoidable in the first period of the transition to socialism. That peasant is a working peasant, the comrade and equal of the socialist worker, his most faithful ally, his blood brother in the fight against the yoke of capital. Whereas that peasant who clandestinely sold 
40 million poods of grain at 10 times the state price, taking advantage of the need and hunger of the city worker, deceiving the state, and everywhere increasing and creating deceit, robbery, and fraud, that peasant is a profiteer, an ally of the capitalist, a class enemy of the worker, an exploiter. For whoever possesses surplus grain gathered from land belonging to the whole state, with the hope of implements in which in one way or another is embodied the labor of not only of the peasant, but also of the worker, and so on. Whoever possesses a surplus of grain and profiteers in that grain is an exploiter of the hungry worker. You are violators of freedom, equality, and democracy. They shout at us on all sides, pointing to the inequality of the worker and the peasant under our constitution, to the dissolution of the constituent assembly, to the forcible confiscation of surplus grain, and so forth. We reply, never in the world has there been a state which has done so much to remove the actual inequality, the actual lack of freedom from which the working peasant has been suffering for centuries. But we shall never recognize equality for the peasant profiteer, just as we do not recognize equality between the exploiter and the exploited. Between the sated and the hungry, nor the freedom for the former to rob the latter. And those educated people who refuse to recognize this difference, we shall treat them as white guards, even though they may call themselves Democrats, Socialists, Internationalists, Kautskys, Chernovs, or Marthovs. 5. Socialism means the abolition of class. The dictatorship of the proletariat has done all it could to abolish classes, but classes cannot be abolished in one stroke. And classes still remain, and will remain, in the era of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship will become unnecessary when classes disappear. Without the dictatorship of the proletariat, they will not disappear. Classes have remained, but in the era of the dictatorship of the proletariat, every class has undergone a change, and the relations between the classes have also changed. The class struggle does not disappear under the dictatorship of the proletariat. It merely assumes a different form. Under capitalism, the proletariat was an oppressed class, a class which had been deprived of the means of production. The only class which stood directly and completely opposed to the bourgeoisie, and therefore the only one which stood directly and completely opposed to the bourgeoisie, and therefore the only class capable of being revolutionary to the very end. Having overthrown the bourgeoisie and conquered political power, the proletariat has become the ruling class. It wields state power. It exercises control over means of production already socialized. It guides the wavering and intermediary elements of classes. It crushes the increasingly stubborn resistance of the exploiters. All these are specific tasks of the class struggle. Tasks which the proletariat former did not and could not have for itself. The class of exploiters, the landowners, and capitalists has not disappeared and cannot disappear all at once under the dictatorship of the proletariat. The exploiters have been smashed, but not destroyed. They still have an international base in the form of international capital, of which they are a branch. They still retain certain means of production in part, they still have money, they still have vast social connections. Because they have been defeated, the energy of their resistance has increased a hundred and a thousand fold. The art of state, military, and economic administration gives them a superiority, and a very great superiority, so that their importance is incomparably greater than their numerical proportion of the population.
The class struggle waged by the overthrown exploiters against the victorious vanguard of the exploited, i.e. the proletariat, has become incomparably more bitter. And it cannot be otherwise in the case of a revolution, unless this conception is replaced, as it is by all the heroes of the Second International, by reformist illusions. Lastly, the peasants, like the petty bourgeoisie in general, occupy a halfway, intermediate position even under the dictatorship of the proletariat. On the one hand, they are fairly large, and in backward Russia, a vast mass of working people. United by a common interest of all working people to emancipate themselves from the landowner and the capitalist. On the other hand, they are disunited, small properteers, property owners, and traders. Such an economic position inevitably causes them to vacillate between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. In view of the acute form which the struggle between these two classes has assumed, in view of the incredibly severe breakup of all social relations, and in view of the great attachment of the peasants and the petty bourgeoisie generally to the old, the routine, and the unchanging, it is only natural that we should inevitably find them swinging from one side to the other, that we should find them wavering, changeable, uncertain, and so on. In relations to this class, or to these social elements, the proletariat must strive to establish its influence over it to guide it, to give leadership to the vacillating and unstable, such is the task of the proletariat. If we compare all the basic forces of classes and their interrelations, as modified by the dictatorship of the proletariat, we shall realize how unutterably nonsensical and theoretically stupid is the common petty bourgeois idea shared by all representatives of the Second International that the transition to socialism is possible by means of democracy in general. The fundamental source of this error lies in the prejudice inherited from the bourgeoisie that democracy is something absolute and above classes. As a matter of fact, democracy itself passes into an entirely new phase under the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the class struggle rises to a higher level, dominating over each and every form. General talk about freedom, equality, and democracy is in fact but a blind repetition of concepts shared by the relations of commodity production. To attempt to solve the concrete problems of the dictatorship of the proletariat by such generalities is tantamount to accepting the theories and principles of the bourgeoisie in their entirety. From the point of view of the proletariat, the question can be put only in the following way. Freedom from oppression by which class? Equality of which class with which? Democracy based on private property or on a struggle for the abolition of private property, and so forth. Long ago, Engels, in his anti During, explained that the concept equality is molded from the relations of commodity production. Equality becomes a prejudice if it is not understood to mean the abolition of classes. This elementary truth regarding the distinction between the bourgeois democratic and the socialist conception of inequality is constantly being forgotten. But if it is not forgotten, it becomes obvious that by overthrowing the bourgeoisie, the proletariat takes the most decisive step towards the abolition of classes, and that in order to complete the process, the proletariat must continue its class struggle, making use of the apparatus of state power and employing various methods of combating, influencing, and bringing pressure to bear on the overthrown bourgeoisie and the vacillating petty bourgeoisie, October 30th, 1919.